Welcome, and thank you for joining the New America Fellows Program for this webinar discussion of Jude Joffe Block and Terry Green Sterling's Driving While Brown, Sheriff Show Arpaio versus the, the Latino Resistance. I'm Awis Dayub, Director of the Fellows Program. For more than 20 years, New America has supported hundreds of fellows who've gone on to publish books, produce documentary, documentary films, and other deeply reported projects. We're grateful to be able to host this conversation with you today as we welcome Jude and Tracy to New America for a timely and necessary conversation about immigration reform. Before we start, a few housekeeping notes. If you have questions during the event, please submit them through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we'll pass them to the moderator. If you need closed captioning, Zoom now provides that function. Please click the CC bar uh, um, button at the bottom of the screen. We encourage you to sign up for our newsletter and events list so that you can learn more about our work and receive invitations for future fellows program events. And you can find the information on our website. And last and most importantly, copies of Driving Well Brown are available for purchase through our book selling partner, Solid State Books. You can find the tiny URL link on the event slide um, on your screen. Before I turn the conversation over to John, Jude and Terry, let me introduce you to our speakers today. Jude Joffe Block joined the Associated Press as a reporter and editor in 2020. Before that, she reported on immigration for more than a decade for outlets that include NPR, The Guardian, and the Arizona Center for Investigative Reporting. She was a visiting journalist at the Russell Sage Foundation and also fellow with us at New America through a partnership with the Center for Future of Arizona. She was also a Logan Nonfiction Program Fellow while co-authoring co this book. She began her journalism career in Mexico. Terry Green Sterling is affiliated faculty and writer in residence at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. She is the author of Illegal. Her writing is in published in the Washington Post, the Rolling Stone, Newsweek, the Atlantic, Slate, the Daily Beast, and other publications. She's editor at large for the Arizona Center for Investigative Reporting and a three-time Arizona Journalist of the Year. Jonathan Blister, who will be moderating today's conversation, is a 2021 Emerson Fellow with us at New America. He's also a staff writer at The New Yorker. He is at work on a book about immigration and Central America for Penguin Press. Jonathan is a recipient of an Edward R. Murrow Award and a National Award for Education Reporting. In 2018, he received the Immigration Journalism Prize for the French, from the French American Foundation and a Media Leadership Award from the American Immigration Lawyers Association. With that, I'll turn the conversation over to Jude and Terry, and they'll start us off with a brief five minute presentation about their work. Thank you. Do we have the slideshow up? I can't tell. Yes? Hi, this is Terry. Um, and I just very briefly, we have a very brief slideshow for you. Driving While Brown is a book about a powerful Arizona sheriff, and he's known throughout the world for his immigration crackdowns. Because he famously bullies or retaliates against critics, few in Arizona have the courage to stand up to him. The system of checks and balances breaks down, so what it takes is a fearless Latino resistance to rise up against him and fight him and try to stop him, as well as other civil rights abuses that are going on at the time, including Arizona laws, new Arizona laws that are meant to criminalize and deport immigrants. Next slide, please. And so we have just a few slides to introduce you to some of the people that are featured in the book. And um, Sheriff Joe Arpaio, or former Sheriff Joe Arpaio, was elected in 1992 and um, became known as America's toughest sheriff and, and really built a, a national profile for his tough on jail inmates tactics. And so his inmates had to sleep in outdoor tents or sentence inmates did. They, had, they were forced to wear pink underwear, wear black and white stripes. Um, there were also um, wrongful death lawsuits that um, revealed that some inmates had, been, had died in restraint chairs or after tasing events. And next slide. 
Um, and then in the 2000s, um, in the mid 2000s, Arpaio pivots to become really the country's most famous immigration enforcer. And we'll talk about that pivot more in our presentation, um, but immigration themed traffic stops uh, that led to the arrests of undocumented drivers and passengers who were turned over to ICE uh, for deportation was a major part of this strategy. Next slide. Briefly, um, we'd like to introduce you to Lydia Guzman. Uh, she is one of the members of the Latino resistance who is a key character in our book. Uh, um, as Arpaio ramps up his immigration enforcement, she ramps up her activism, which creates a lot of tension in her life. And she pays a very high price for, um, for her activism personally. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and I'd also like to introduce you to Carlos Garcia. Um, he is an undocu he is, was once an undocumented immigrant, so he takes this um, Arpaio's actions very personally. And he helps organize daring protests that force Arizona and the nation not to look away. Next slide, please. And this is our final slide. This is Danny Ortega, another member of the, of the resistance um, who we'll be discussing. Um, but we wanted to share this one because it gets to why we titled the book Driving While Brown. Um, it's a reference not just to the racial profiling episodes that happened under Arpaio's immigration enforcement, but also a reference to the long history of immigration themed traffic stops in Arizona um, over, over the past several decades. And so, um, for example, in the 1970s, there was a um, police department outside of Phoenix that was cracking down on farm workers and pulling them over and asking them for to show papers. And Danny Ortega was a young man at the time. He was born in the United States, but the son of a farm worker. And he explained to us how those kinds of tactics felt like an attack on him. He told us people were being stopped because they were brown, driving while brown. So we thought, saw this not only as an attack on the undocumented community, we saw it as an attack on us simply because of the features of our skin and our hair color and our language. And that concludes our slideshow. Well, thank, thank you both for that. And, and, and congrats to you both again. I know I've already congratulated you heartily uh, separate from this conversation on the book. It's, it's, it's a real achievement and it's, um, it's so critically important. I mean, rereading it, I'm so struck by how much the Arpaio story isn't really just a microcosm of what's happened in the US over the last few decades. I mean, it is, it is literally the center of that story. Um, I mean, I, I say that without exaggeration. Um, so I want to launch right in. I want to hear everything you both have to say uh, about what you've uncovered in years of reporting on this. Um, and I guess my first question in some ways follows from that slideshow, because, you know, for someone like me who followed this more or less from afar, uh, and for other people who were tuned in to this story as a kind of national story, Joe Arpaio very much arrived on the scene as this sort of ready-made image of a tough anti-immigrant lawman. Um, and so one of the things that struck me in the early parts of your book was actually getting the backstory about how he wasn't necessarily always that person. Sure, he was always kind of this snarling, media-obsessed, unscrupulous uh, sheriff, fine. Um, but the particular anti-immigrant animus seemed to start much later in his career, in the early 2000s. Um, and I wanna, I wanna ask you about kind of what your sense was of, of when and why that turn happened in his career. Um, and you know, even just to set it up, you know, I was, I, was, I was looking back over some of the things he said, as, as you cite in the book, and you know, there was one instance in 2005 of, of, of essentially a vigilante arresting a bunch of undocumented immigrants at gunpoint, um, and it caused a major scandal, and you guys can talk more about this. Uh, but at the time, Arpaio said, um, and this is a direct quote, we should never take the law in our own hands. You don't pull a gun on people because they look like they're here illegally. I would never in my wildest dreams attribute that quote to Joe Arpaio. And yet that was Joe Arpaio at a particular moment in time before he made this shift. So, so talk to me a little bit about kind of when in his career this shift happens and, and, and how you understand it. 
Well, it really tied to that event. Um, th this vigilante who who uh, held the, the a group of migrants at gunpoint at a rest stop on the outskirts of Maricopa County, that happened in 2005 and it quickly became a flashpoint. So um, he, Arpaio's deputies arrested this man. Um, the quote you read was Arpaio defending that decision. The reason he had to defend that decision was because there was an outcry from um, people, in, mostly in the Republican Party, uh, who were worried about illegal immigration, who saw this um, this stop of these uh, migrants at gunpoint. They saw this this man whose name was Patrick Hab as an American hero who had performed a citizen's arrest and should be praised, not jailed. And um, and the county attorney at the time had run in 2004 on a platform where he had lawn signs that said, stop illegal immigration, vote Andy Thomas for county attorney. This is, county attorney is a local, it's the equivalent of a DA. I mean, this is a local prosecutor who ran on a stop illegal immigration platform for a local office, which was pretty unprecedented. That's not considered to be a local issue or had not been at the time. And so this county attorney, seized on this fervor that was happening um, and announced he would not be pressing charges against Patrick Hab, who had held them at gunpoint. Um, and it really showed the potency of this, um, this rising movement who wanted to uh, really do something about illegal immigration and wanted elected officials to join that cause. And Arpaio took a lot of heat for his role, um, for being on the wrong side of that issue actually the second time in 2005 that he found himself on the wrong side of um, sort of his base, his own, what, who would become his base, his own uh, views on immigration. There was another episode where he helped an undocumented woman go, go to Mexico and come back after her children were kidnapped, her U.S. citizen children were kidnapped. That was also something that Arpaio uh, did and, and said, look, I'm going to help these U.S. citizen kids and this family stay together. And um, other people questioned, why is this undocumented woman getting this, this special treatment? Um, and so what we see is after this outcry over the HAB event, um, Arizona state legislature also begins passing laws, the first of which is in two, takes effect in 2006. And Arpaio partners with the very county attorney who he'd been on opposite sides with to interpret a new law in ways that even the legislature hadn't imagined and really goes above and beyond. So there had been this law that said that smugglers who are driving migrants into Arizona can be uh, charged with felonies, a state felony for doing that. And Arpaio and the county attorney decide that they can charge the migrants themselves with felonies for participating in a conspiracy to smuggle themselves, which goes beyond what the lawmakers had intended. But this is part, this is just 2006, Arpaio's real pivot is taking place and he emerges as someone who's not only enthusiastically enforcing state laws, but even going above and beyond what the intent of those laws were. And that's really when we start to see his shift. And um, in 2007, it ramps up even more when he gets a partnership with the federal government through the 287G program. But I think we quickly see how the political winds are changing in Arizona, that, that um, certain voters are demanding this of their elected officials, and, um, and he responds to that. And, and, and let me direct a question to Terry that's related to that, which is, you know, tell me again, focusing on this period, I mean, we'll get to the, the stuff in 2000, later 2006 and 2007 with the, the agreements with the federal government, which is a huge part of the story, obviously. But just to understand a little bit more of this pivot of his, because it's incredibly striking. I mean, it's done in plain sight. He basically, more or less overnight, rebrands himself as sure, a, a, your kind of run of the mill, colorful, tough on crime sheriff to someone who is specifically animated by anti-immigrant um, sentiment and policing. Where are the criticisms of, uh, of, of Arpaio at that time coming from? Who's he, who's he hearing? What clearly it's striking to me because he's pretty popular even at that time. And despite his popularity, he's still sensitive enough to whatever this kind of nascent right wing sentiment is that he rebrands himself accordingly. So Terry, tell us a little bit about 
kind of where the criticism's coming at that time and what that, what that shows us about the state. Okay, uh, let me just throw in a couple of thoughts first. Um, first of all, I, I think it's really important for us not to diminish uh, his early years as sheriff in the jails because um, there were many um, civil rights abuses and the Justice Department was looking at it and uh, it, start, it, it kind of fits into a pattern of picking on the voiceless on those uh, who, who have no power to fight back. So, um, so really um, his personality shows through not only in the jails, but also when he pivots. So he's pivoting politically, but he's not pivoting his personality, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, we can't diminish the guy ever because serious things happen in the jails. And so, okay, so um, the criticism comes in the form of newspapers, uh, news letters to the editor. Um, and it's really important to note that Arpaio seeks approbation and self-identifies with how much, how much press he gets. Um, and so when he sees people that he knows support him, start criticizing him in letters to the editor, in newspapers, which are so very important to him, then um, that explains basically what he does. That's, these people are letter to the editor writers, right? <laughs> you know, they, uh, they're, they're mostly elderly or they're angry. They're, they're people in this nascent movement. They're getting a lot of misinformation about immigrants that they want to believe because they're uncomfortable with changing demographics. And you asked about what was changing in Arizona at the time. We had the funnel effect that, that we all talk about in journalism um, in which um, uh, corridor, immigration corridors in California and Texas and New Mexico are pretty much sealed off. And the thinking is that the Arizona desert is so harsh that no one's, that it's its own wall. But in fact, um, it, sealing off these, these corridors ends up having um, the immigrants coming through Arizona. And this causes a lot of unrest with uh, folks who are not used to seeing so many brown people in Arizona. And I do want to flag that from, you know, this is something that we asked Arpaio about, this pivot moment. And to this day, he, he, he remains steadfast that he did the right thing about Patrick Hobb, um, the, the vigilante, and, and won't, does not see that as a mistake or, or won't speak about it as a mistake. Um, so he stands firm on those comments that, that you read um, and still echoes them today, which is interesting. Um, he'll say that, that what changed was the state law, that, that once the state laws started to change, it was his duty to enforce it. Um, but as we point out, he really goes above and beyond what's what's written in the law and, and takes unprecedented steps and trailblazes really a new trail for local law enforcement and immigration. So it does seem like there are, you know, it it does seem to suggest that it's more than that. Yeah. And let, let's talk about that state law because it's, it's it's such a key moment in his political development. And I'm struck even just hearing, I mean, reading your descriptions of the law and, and even hearing your quick characterization now by, by how much that law ends up anticipating and foreshadowing things that honestly we've been hearing over the last few years. So, so tell us about this human smuggling law and, and specifically, I mean, you say Arpaio goes above and beyond in, in enforcing and interpreting it. Um, but it, it does seem to me one thing that has to be sort of reckoned with about that law is that it was signed into, well, the bill was signed into law by a democratic governor, um, Janet Napolitano, who's someone who will obviously be following through the course of this story because she winds up uh, you know, being Obama's first DHS secretary. Um, how aware should Democrats have been about the kind of true nature of that human smuggling law? Lay it out for us. What did the law say? How did it get perverted? Yeah, and um, so the, the law, I mean, they called it um, the anti-coyote law, the, the Arizona human smuggling law. It actually sort of, we had trouble with it because it couldn't kind of find its official name. It, it got branded a few different ways. But, um, but basically it says that if you, um, if you 
drive someone from uh, the border into Arizona and um, they're found to be migrants who have just crossed the border, you can be charged with a felony for driving them. Um, that was the intent of the law. It passed with bipartisan support. And there was this whole kind of the, the debate at the time when legislators were talking about it. I mean, there were speakers who were concerned about trafficking and, and um, women who were being abused and how this would crack down on the criminals who were taking advantage of undocumented people and putting them in danger. I mean, that was really the rhetoric around it at the time. And, and at the time we did find some comments where there was a, a, a Latino lawmaker, Ben Miranda, who did voice some concern and said, wait a second, could this be perverted so that if you have you know, somebody driving their undocumented neighbor to a doctor's appointment, like at what, where do we, how do we distinguish, you know, who's a smuggler coming from the border versus somebody in interior Phoenix driving in, in a mixed status family? And where are those lines? And so that, that concern was raised, but it was very peripheral at the time and um, not really thought much of, but then, um, when this new interpretation comes out that the people in the cars can be charged with conspiracy, some of the lawmakers who were behind it actually spoke out and said, that's not, that was not what we intended. And, and there's um, the coalition that we write about in the book, the, the resistance, um, one of their first acts is actually to help fuel a, a lawsuit to challenge this interpretation of charging the migrants with conspiracy to smuggle themselves as our pilot is doing. And um, <clears throat> it's a federal case, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, <clears throat> is filed like in 2006 or seven, it's not resolved until 2013 when finally a judge says, oh, this policy is not constitutional. And it, it it's a sign of how slowly the courts can move and how many people were impacted <clears throat> by that policy in the meantime, I'll take a little break. Hold no, on. Okay. Can I <laughs> and, yeah, and, and let me just, I mean, Terry, I wanna hear your thoughts too, but but to sort of follow <laughs> from what Jude's saying, give us a, give give people who are, who are listening here a kind of concrete sense of, of the mechanics of how this perverted interpretation of the law played out. I mean, we're talking about the ugliest forms and the most brazen and naked forms of racial profiling. What kind of stuff did you hear from people about how the human smuggling law became uh, interpreted and implemented by Arpaio and his, and his people? Well, I mean, first of all, I think the Democrats, the, you know, we're, it's a very red state. The state house is very red um, and it's got a lot of uh, rural, very powerful rural lawmakers. Um, and I think they, I think the rhetoric bamboozled the Democrats. Um, I, I think they just, you know, fell asleep at the wheel sort of weren't thinking right because they were listening to the rhetoric, but not what it might do. Um, Arpaio, this is important. Arpaio is a former DEA uh, guy and he likes to book people on conspiracies. He's a big conspiracy guy, goes into, he also espouses conspiracy theories. So basically what happens is um, Arpaio and the county attorney um, get together and decide they can arrest the migrants in these big vans for conspiring to smuggle themselves into Arizona. So that's basically the nut of it. What happens is they stop these vans and, um, or trucks or whatever they are and arrest everybody and, and charge them, charge most of them with these felonies um, which are deportable. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and that's a whole point. Yeah. And then yeah. what's interesting about, I mean, so once he starts this human smuggling unit to go after migrants, yeah, then- Tell us about that unit, by the way, just lay it out for people. Yeah, so that like this dedicated unit um, is formed that um, does what they call interdiction, which is driving on uh, rural roads outside of Maricopa County, looking for load, what they call load vehicles that have um, large numbers of migrants in them. But at a certain point, the strategy shifts from sort of these outskirts and people who have just coming from the border to enforcement that's happening inside urban parts of the of the county where more established, like long term immigrant populations are 
could be pulled over in traffic stops. And so, so the deputies who are trained in this sort of rural interdiction are the same ones who then are swarming urban neighborhoods in these kind of shock and awe sweeps that Arpaio implements. And so the idea with these sweeps is that um, deputies will flood certain neighborhoods, pull over cars for um, any kind of traffic violation, broken taillight, a cracked windshield, failure to signal. And then in, and Arpaio has announced these in advance to the media and said, any anybody with an um, outstanding warrant, anybody who, who we think is guilty of criminal charges, and any undocumented immigrants, or he, he doesn't quite use that terminology, uh, who are discovered, they will be arrested and turned over to ICE. And so what you have is a situation where deputies who are kind of in this mindset that they are hunting migrants who and turning them over to ICE because this is their training in the human smuggling unit are then also in these these um, urban areas doing these massive sweeps where they're pulling over cars and then they have a car and a passenger and a driver and they're going to be asking for ID and trying to establish if that person has legal status to be in the country. Now you both point out in the book that you know under this human smuggling law and these wild reinterpretations of what that empowers Arpaio and his human smuggling unit to do, his, his office, I mean, is arresting hundreds of immigrants at a time. Then in 2007, you have a federal component to what uh, Arpaio is allowed and able to do. Uh, and that is a, a collaboration with the federal government, with immigration, with the federal immigration authorities. These are known as 287G agreements, which I'm going to ask you about very specifically. But, but you make the point in the book, you know, you go from basically hundreds of arrests at a time, which is hellish and nightmarish enough, to I mean, quite literally thousands, um, that this really kind of brings Arpaio into his own. Tell us about the 287G agreements, uh, because those agreements aren't, I mean, ostensibly, and, and, and this is so interesting in, in, in your book, this isn't a figment of the kind of right-wing restrictionist movement. I mean, you eventually have even the Obama administration a few years down the line continuing these agreements. So, so tell us what these agreements are and, and how Arpaio makes use of them. And the, these agreements first kind of come online right after 9-11 is when the, these discussions of, of this happens. And I think there's some recognition of, oh, if, if local law enforcement had been more involved in immigration matters, maybe some of the hijackers could have been discovered sooner if we had more, if only we'd had more collaboration. There's some of these discussions at play. And so the first uh, agreements start getting signed um, in, in really the second half of the Bush, uh, W. Bush administration. Um, and Arpaio is, is pretty early on, 2007. There's, he's not the first, but he's the first really big agreement. He has um, over 100 um, of people in his office who, who are signed on to this. And it's a mix of both his deputies who are patrolling the streets and his officers who are in the jail. And the, the, in the jail, it means that his officers can use an ICE database to check if anybody who's been booked into the jail um, might be undocumented or, or has been deported before or might be an um, illegal immigrant who is now charged of a crime that might make them deportable. All of this information is now at the fingertips about whether somebody could be now potentially deportable or could be placed in deportation proceedings. What's, what's really key here, though, is the, um, the deputization of, of those who are patrolling the streets who now have federal immigration powers. And they go through a training from ICE um, to learn sort of the basics of immigration enforcement. And the 287G fact sheet that we found from the time makes clear that this partnership is supposed to be to discover so-called criminal aliens, uh, people who have committed crimes who might be involved in gangs um, and identify those who might be deported. And the, the fact sheet just specifically says it is not intended to be used to round up day laborers or to be used um, for minor in minor traffic violations. Um, and yet that is exactly what we see happening under Arpaio's use of this program. Um, and it's also worth noting that ICE 
is the one that trains uh, Arpaio's deputies through this 287G training that when they're deciding, making a calculus of who to question about immigration status, um, when there's a suspicion that someone might be undocumented and sort of how to line, how to choose when to go into those kinds of questions, that Mexican appearance can be one factor when deciding uh, who to question, as long as it's not the only factor. And that that's actually, uh, there is a Supreme Court precedent that does say that. Um, in the Ninth Circuit, the Ninth Circuit had updated that to say actually in areas that are have a heavy Latino population, that's really a very outdated tool and should not be used. Um, and so that ends up being part of the, eventually when Arpaio's sued for racial profiling, a federal judge finds that that training and the fact that some of his deputies had retained that understanding from the training was one of the indications that, that racial profiling had taken place. Um, before I come to you, Terry, because I have you know, a million follow-up questions to that. That was great. Um, I do want to. I do want to read a brief passage from the book because you know one of the one of the really striking things about the book. I mean, just reporter to reporter here, I'm floored by how much ground you cover over such an extended period of time. I mean, I mean, the, the sheer number of people you talk to from every side of the issue really creates this incredible mosaic effect. So I, I want I want people tuning in to get a little sense of kind of what some of the, the, the horror was on the streets of Arizona dur during this time when you had the combined effect of the human smuggling law, when you had the reality of these 287G agreements. Obviously in the book, there are so many tragic examples I can draw from. I, I picked one that I thought was particularly visceral. Um, and so it's about a, a man named uh, Daniel Magos, who's, uh, who's Mexican by birth. Uh, he's in his mid sixties at the time of, of this scene that I'm about to read. Um, and he is a U.S. citizen. Um, and so uh, here's, I'm, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit because it's a long passage. Um, but you say, Magos, a small man with neat, closely cropped gray-brown hair and dark, intelligent eyes had gained his American citizenship more than 40 years earlier after immigrating from Mexico legally as a child. So he didn't expect to use the hotline himself. And, we'll, and, and just for everyone's awareness, we'll talk about this hotline. This is basically a a really incredible resource that that activists created, uh, led led in this case uh, by by a woman. We'll we'll hear much more about. Um, but that changed one morning in December two thousand nine, when Magos and his wife Eva, who had come along to keep him company, headed from their home to a job at an apartment building in South Phoenix. Out of the corner of his eye, Magos could see the tall watchtower hovering over the tent city jail. This is Arpaio's kind of trademark jail a landmark of sorts that signals to locals that a sprawl of Maricopa County Sheriff's Office jails and administration buildings were nearby. Magos turned left onto a straight wide lane of Durango Road. There wasn't a lot of traffic, just landscaping trucks pulling trailers laden with grass clippings and tree branches. The trucks were likely driven, driven by Latino landscapers heading to a nearby landfill, Magos knew. He'd driven this road many times, but on this day, he would come to realize that the abundance of landscaping trucks en route to the dump and the proximity to the jails made this area an excellent hunting ground for deputies in search of unauthorized Latino immigrants. Uh, almost done. I, he had rolled down his window before making the turn onto Durango Road, only to lock eyes with a sheriff's deputy driving past him in the opposite lane. The deputy, Dan Russell, turned around and flashed his police lights. Mago soon realized he was the target. He drove past a cornfield and in some industrial buildings and pulled over to the side of the road near an abandoned farmhouse with a rickety chicken coop. He wondered why the deputy wasn't getting out of his vehicle. He and Ava, who had no reason to mistrust the police, got out of their truck to see what he wanted. The deputy jumped out, shouting and gripping his holstered gun. Magos and Ava scrambled back into their truck, and Magos feared that if he questioned the deputy's authority, he might get shot. So this is the reason I read that passage at such length. First of all, I mean, the writing is fantastic, and, and what a moment. But this is an American citizen um, who, is pulled over because of his appearance uh, and because of how emboldened these, these sheriff's deputies have become in this landscape. So I, I wanna shift the conversation a little bit uh, and, and, and Terry, lead us off here because you made this point in your opening, in your opening slideshow. I wanna talk about the resistance, um, the Latino resistance that forms in response to all of this. Um, and you know the thing, and I was struck by, by Terry saying this, and this comes through of course in the book, the people who 
the few people who had the courage to face up to Arpaio at this time were the people who actually had the most to lose. Uh, it, it's quite an incredible story of, of courage and fortitude in the face of a very real risk. Um, Terry, tell us who, I mean, tell us a little bit about, about uh, Lydia Guzman, about Carlos Garcia, the kind of different strands of this resistance as they take shape. Because this story that I just read from Daniel Magos um, is the result of him calling a tip line that some of these activists have created to help protect members of their community. Right. Well, it's important, I think, um, for us to recognize that this resistance is built upon uh, decade upon decade of discrimination against Mexican immigrants and Mexican American citizens in the in Arizona. And so resistance is not new to the Latino community in Arizona. It's been happening since at least the 1930s. Um, and uh, this one is is in my view, it becomes kind of a model for resistance against unconstitutional policing in the United States because it has many facets to it. And, and then I'll get into the characters, but just very briefly, um, it, the resistance um, becomes a, a multi-pronged approach to um, bring attention to the problem constantly in the streets in these civil in these actions that you can't turn your head away from because they're so colorful and they're so lively. Um, the second the second point is the courts. Um, the third is the public square, and that goes um, you know along with the resistance in the streets because this brings journalists' attention to the problem, and then the, then um, the people in the resistance have voice in the media. And um, the final thing is in the voting booth. Um, the resistance registers all these voters. Lydia Guzman, um, the tension between Lydia Guzman and Joe Arpaio, um, I think carry us through the book a lot um, because either one is on top of the, you know, one person, either Arpaio has a victory or Lydia has a victory, which causes immense problems for the other one, right? Lydia uh, was a California activist who was galvanized by Prop 187 in California. She came to Arizona right at the time, right after some raids in Chandler, some immigration raids in Chandler in the 90s. And um, she, she immediately joins, uh, it becomes an activist. And um, ultimately she, as, as Arpaio's immigration enforcement ramps up, she starts a she is gets funding for a hotline that serves as a social services network and also serves as a way to gather plaintiffs for a lawsuit. Um, she pays an, an enormously high price for her activism uh, that includes uh, marital problems, problems with her kids, uh, losing a house, huge financial problems. But she can't, because she's out in the streets getting names and, and information about these people who are arrested, she can't turn away. So she's always torn. And her story shows the story, the, the impact of activism on families, on the families of the activists, right? Because it's, it's consuming. Um, the Carlos Garcia grew Sorry, up- let me pause you quickly while you're talking. I, I, I'm very curious to hear about Carlos Garcia. Let me just remind everyone who's listening um, please send questions as you're hearing all this, because if there are particular things that, that Terry or Jude are saying that spark questions or further thoughts, I can pick up your questions at the end. So bear that in mind as you're listening. Keep going, Terry, sorry. Okay, so Carlos Garcia, um, he and I have, um, have, have some roots in the same town in, in Sonora. So, so that, that was really great for me. Um, Carlos Garcia was an, grew up undocumented in the United States during his childhood, grew up in the streets, uh, had a wonderful mother, um, a single mom. He goes to the university and becomes involved with Mecha and begins uh, learning about Mexican American history and gets a lot of coraje, a lot of outrage. And this leads him to um, become a young activist in, in college, in the university. He then goes on to help with voter outreach and organize you know, students in marches. And ultimately he becomes this 
uh, magnificent leader of these, not leader because he would say he's not a leader, he does it with everybody, it's communal, but his group um, orchestrates uh, magnificent um, street actions um, that, that are very theatrical, that are very Mexican-American, very Mexican, uh, lots of music, um, lots of bravery because undocumented people um, leave themselves vulnerable to getting arrested. And again, this brings press attention to the problem and this gives voice to the other activists. So those are two of our favorite characters. Oh, Jude, you got, you're muted, I think. Okay, great. I just wanted to piggyback on that to, to highlight the contrast between them because this resistance is multifaceted and does not always agree and there are factions. And so um, Lydia, Lydia Guzman represents um, a, a faction that is invested in institutions. She's always trying to, to get the Department of Justice involved. She believes in Democrats and the Democratic Party delivering immigration reform. She um, is willing to partner with and make broad coalitions. So she's actually hired by a local businessman um, to, to run this hotline. And she's always trying to find common cause and make the coalition, the tent broader. Um, whereas Carlos Garcia, I think is, is skeptical of, of such relationships, is worried about, um, do we really have the same interests as, as the business community at the end of the day, if we're trying to protect our people from deportation and, and have them work with dignity? Um, he's very much in, in, um, invested in empowering uh, uh, people who have been victimized by our PIO's policies to be part of the activism, to unseat him from office and putting their stories forward and having them uh, be involved in direct action, civil disobedience. Um, and so we see this, we see how in the end, it's sort of a combination of, of many different facets that come together um, that all have a common goal, but different ways of achieving it. I mean, it's so striking. You'd expect in any robust, healthy, dynamic activist movement, for there to be different kind of factions and different philosophies and, and, and approaches toward the activism. Uh, but it really does seem, and I'm really struck by this reading the book, that it, it took quite literally all of these different players. I mean, if, if it were just one approach, the overall effect really would have been muted and would not have been as successful. So you've got the, you know, the court approach of documenting all of these civil rights abuses, I'm leaving out, I mean, we could talk for days and days about this, but all of the examples, I mean, really over the top examples of abuse of authority uh, by Arpaio and his people, I mean, actually to the extent of they're intimidating people, including local and state officials who speak out or even investigate improprieties in their office. So part of the activist work is documenting all of this and, 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 and Lydia kind of represents, let's say that particular strain, obviously they're all doing everything at once. Carlos is, is, has his eyes too on the need to kind of identify federal hypocrisy a bit in how you have the Obama administration at the time sort of ostensibly pulling away from Arpaio, yet nevertheless continuing those 287G agreements in the form of secure communities and other related programs. But in the end, and this is sort of my last question for you both before we go to questions, because there are a lot of very good questions. You know, Arpaio is mired in all of these laws suits, federal investigations and so on, which Jude, as you say, kind of inches along. I mean, it's agonizing to read in the book because as these, as these, as these investigations inch along, people's lives are in the balance. Um, but it does seem to have a kind of cumulative effect on him that is not, not to be sort of too flippant about it, but is sort of bruising politically to him and to his brand. And so it starts to impact his standing when it comes time for him to stand for reelection, which he does through all of this. And so in 2012, he wins again, but by a much smaller margin than he's used to. And you can kind of almost smell blood in the water. Um, he's, you know, he fulminates against all of his opponents at his actual victory speech. <laughs> um, and then in 2016, quite profoundly, I would say, the same day that Donald Trump is elected, um, he loses. Um, so I guess if there are any kind of global thoughts you have on sort of what, if anything, did him in um, or, or what kind of lessons there were to how this approach kind of brought him low enough to make him almost mortal and politically vulnerable again after all of these years of complete, um, you know, unaccountability. 
Um, so kind of a global, a global summary of that before we go to questions. Yeah, and I think, and Terry hit on this, the, this kind of four-pronged approach of um, protesting in the streets, the public square, the, the courts, and the voting booth. And, the, and we really see these come together in 2016. The, the fact that um, people like Lydia Guzman recruited people like Daniel Magos to become plaintiffs in the racial profiling lawsuit against Arpaio, and that there was a finding against Arpaio of racial profiling and then he disobeyed court orders and then was, was being charged criminally for that, which is, of course, the reason he gets pardoned by, for Trump. We've, we've done remarkably well by not talking about Trump up until this point, <laughs> but it's a big part of the story. Um, and uh, so by the time he's up for re-election in 2016, he's cost taxpayers millions and millions of dollars, and that becomes a talking point in the campaign. And what you start to see is um, not only the resistance galvanizing communities of color to vote and try to vote him out, you also have a situation where um, some moderate Republicans who are willing to kind of go along with Arpaio over the years start to realize, you know, this is this is bad branding for our community, that he's gone too far, this is costing us too much, we just need a boring sheriff, um, which is really the, the Democrat who unseats some campaigns as like, no one outside of our county will know my name, I promise. Um, and so it's really trying to, to get that celebrity idea out of there. And what's interesting is Arpaio loses, but he, he uh, fundraises $13 million, that race from his fans all over the country. And at the same time is stumping for Donald Trump on the campaign trail. So it's really this, this mix of, on the one hand, he's on the stage at the Republican National Convention, and on the other hand, he's losing his own, his own local election. Yeah, it's, it's so well said. I mean, I, again, as you say, I mean, the, the, the Trump Arpaio, not just parallels, <laughs> the stories intersect directly, um, is, I mean, I, I'll leave that for another conversation because it is just so overwhelmingly obvious. And I want, I want people to really get some of these details. Terry, let me direct the first question uh, to you. Uh, it's a very good question from Silvia Rodriguez Vega. She asks, can you talk about the impact of racial profiling and driving while brown on children, immigrant children in particular, children of immigrants, kids in general? Give us a sense of, of, of what you uncovered in your reporting and in, in the way of trauma and the lasting impact of all of this. Sylvia, um, thank you so much for asking this question. Um, I, I teach at Arizona State University and um, my students felt the impact of this trauma. So it's not only the, the reporting that I have done through the years uh, covering this, but I, I see it in my students. They want to talk to me about it all the time. What they often say, um, well, there, there are a number of things, but they remember that as children, because these events happened 10 years ago, so, so my students are now in their 20s um, and they're traumatized by it. They remember that as children, they were uh, locked in their homes. You know, they were not allowed to go outside because you know, they remember the overwhelming fear that their parents had. Um, they remember the loss of family in the sense of, you know, not being able to get together. Uh, it, it, it was almost like um, COVID quarantine, only something even as terrifying or possibly more terrifying for them than COVID. Um, so they couldn't get together with their families for any birthday parties or anything. There was a great uh, uh, exodus, uh, a diaspora of immigrants uh, who left Arizona and the children who stayed in Arizona then missed their aunts and their uncles and their, and their cousins. Um, they felt very isolated. But this had an impact um, that was, that gave them more resilience, um, that turned many of them into activists or gave many of them uh, career goals that would lend uh, that would in which they could lend their skill sets to activism um, because they never wanted to see this again and they certainly didn't want their children to see it again. And so when we um, actually did a little book talk at, at, the, at Arizona State University at the Walter Cronkite School where I teach, 
Um, you could sense the trauma in the questions um, that they asked and in the high attendance of, of the book talk and in their, in their um, just gratitude that someone, someone gave voice to let the, that they gave voice, they were able to give voice to the, to the trauma. So it was a lot of trauma. Thank you so much for asking that question. What, what would you say, this is another question that's related. What do you hope lawmakers will take from your book? If you could send a copy to any lawmaker, who would you send it to? That's another, another question on the list. That's for both, I mean, for both or either of you, however. Jude, do you want me to, you want to take it? <laughs> uh, well, I'm a bit constrained when it comes to sort of the, uh, so, uh, about what I can say about uh, opinion. I work for the AP. And so um, I don't want to go too far down the, the political path, except to say that I think for any lawmaker, I think that this, this story shows um, that uh, immigration enforcement can be an incredibly politically potent tool. Arpaio demonstrated that, Trump demonstrated that. Both regimes also demonstrated that it's very easy to cross the line constitutionally when you crack down on immigration and find yourself on the wrong side of the law. And, um, and what the Arizona example and California before it with the Prop 187 um, backlash shows is that, that powerful backlashes can emerge that will reshape the political dynamics of the state. Um, you know, I don't want to overstate that Arizona went blue in 2020. It's still a very complicated place, but we have seen, uh, it, it, you know, with multiple political factions uh, still having a lot of power. So, but what we did see is that um, the voter demographics have really shifted in Arizona, and there is a a real connection to the kinds of policies that Arizona implemented and our pile implemented that caused people to become activists and voters and register other voters. Um, That's great. T Terry, tell me, the, the, the person who beat Arpaio for the sheriff, in the sheriff's race in 2016, right, right. Paul Penzone, I mean, there was, a lot of, there was a lot of excitement about him. What's the reality? Because this, this goes to what Jude's saying too, sort of what's, the, you know, the smoke clears from the Arpaio years these 287G agreements, these, these, these cooperations with the federal government for immigration enforcement, what's the state of play now in Arizona? Okay, well, first I, I wanna preface this, that the state of play in Arizona now is something that um, reminds us all that resistance is a long game and that um, the resistors um, and everyone else must always be vigilant as to what's really happening. Um, that's sort of the moral of the story of what's happening in Arizona right now. So Paul Penzone um, was a Democrat, uh, former Phoenix cop. He was, um, he, he defeated Arpaio largely um, because, well, for two reasons. One, because the many in the resistance supported him and signed up a lot of anti, you know, Arpaio voters, registered a lot of voters. Um, and the, and the second reason is um, because the resistance and Penzone both showed how expensive our pile was. Mm -hmm. he, this lawsuit, this class action lawsuit is gonna cost 178 million. It's gonna cost taxpayers 178 million by the end of 2021 and there's no end in sight. And um, Penzone is now, now that our pile has left the scene um, sort of, Mm -hmm. Penzone is uh, now named in the lawsuit, right? And um, that's the other, he didn't win because he wanted to be in the lawsuit, but he won in part because he showed the business community how expensive our pile was. So now that he's, now that he's in office, um, he's been not being compliant exactly. Um, the judge is uh, concerned about certain reports and certain filings that he wants him to be more compliant and has threatened him with contempt, possibly. Mm -hmm. um, he took down Tent City and um, didn't want ICE in the jails, but then he got so much pressure uh, that, he, that ICE was sort of reinstated in the jails. So uh, the resistance is uh, mostly 
very uh, angry at Penzone, but they think he's better than Arpaio. So what does this say about Arizona? It says that the resistance remains active and remains vigilant and is just going to stop, is going to try to stop abuses every step of the way. And I think there's some factions of the resistance who would say, actually, for all intents and purposes, he's he's actually not even that much better than Arpaio and, and feel a real sense of betrayal and disappointment because there is still a immigration law enforcement nexus at play. If you get arrested in Maricopa County and are booked into the jail, ICE agents will, will be there. Um, and so I, I think it, it's a mixed bag within the resistance. Others, others are, are happy that he's there and are, are willing to support him and, and participate in his, in his office. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, here's, here's the, this is a question from Sarah and will probably be our last question. And I'm, I'm very happy to end here because it's a question I am dying to ask myself. You know, you're both independent journalists, um, very successful independent journalists. You're collaborating on this book project. It's a massive undertaking. What was the writing process like doing this together, sharing in that process together? Um, do you have any, any kind of, the, what's the sort of highlight reel of that, of that experience, um, this collaboration? I have, I, have a rec I have a recommendation and I, I, for anybody who's going to collaborate, it worked really, really, really well for us. And that is that before we even, even shop the book proposal, um, we had a collaboration agreement in place and it laid out everything. So it lined up who was to do what and um, you know all the financial stuff. And um, it really was wonderful because, because we knew what our jobs were basically. And um, we were both had, we both shared this passion for the story that kept us going through some, you know, kind of bleak times when, you know, we thought we'd never get the book done. <laughs> it just seemed to drag on and on. And um, so, so that was basically it. We had a collaboration agreement that outlined what we, what we were going to do. And um, we stuck to our jobs and we um, listened to each other. And um, I think that's the key, don't you, Jude? Yeah, that's right. And um, everybody in, in, that I met through New America sang the praises of Scrivener for a book writing tool. And sadly, there's there was no good way to use it as a collaboration tool. So I mean, that some of some of it was just the trickiness of being in two different places and collaborating on Google Drive basically um, for years and years, and and making all of our materials available to each other, and and having systems of organization that made sense so we could find stuff. Um, you know, there there was just a lot, a lot more thoughtfulness that had to go into that because we were two people. And and our timeline, <clears throat> you know, we outlined the book and we thought carefully about the chapters and we had a whiteboard and we talked, you know, very carefully. We're trying to figure out how to make the narrative move and incorporate all these characters and policy, you know, and not have them overwhelm the book and not have, you know, the characters overwhelm the book either. So it was a delicate balance, but our timeline had 4,400 entries in it. <laughs> so uh, can thought. you imagine? And so, <laughs> so we just had a lot of discussion. I mean, a collaboration is a lot of discussion. It takes longer than a regular book. Because imagine. of that, yeah, I can imagine. Well, I, you know, we are the very, very happy beneficiaries of this collaboration. So I, I want to thank you both uh, for for your work first and foremost, because it's it's sort of sterling and 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 really impressive and important. I'm going to hold up the spine. I've worked this book over so many times. The jacket's all scuffed up over here, but this is the <laughs> here's the here's the sales pitch with the uh, with the spine. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Again, Jude, Terry, congratulations on your work and uh, everyone should go out and buy this book. Um, thanks, thanks so much everyone for tuning in.